There we go. Hey, Brandon. Hey, Jennifer. I don't, I don't know uh, what was going on, but I'm glad that I was able to connect. Yeah, I don't understand it. I'm just going to have to call IT. This makes no sense to me. Well, and right now it says I'm in the meeting. There we go. Um, I don't know. I So when I clicked on start meeting, it told me that I was waiting for the person to start the meeting. And I'm like, I am the person. So then I tried to sign in, but it wouldn't let me. So I closed out of that and then went back to start a meeting and it let me like launch a whole different um, URL. So then I posted the new URL and thought, well, I'll try it that way. So I guess I'm gonna have to call and learn a little bit more about uh, Zoom. So, Usually when I host a meeting, I do it through my Zoom account, with, not through Columbus States. But my Zoom account last week gave me a hard time um, with recording. It didn't, uh, it didn't record my lecture. So I ended up having to do it again. So anyway, at least here we are. So um, let's do some review and then we'll go back and talk about questions that you have. Does that sound good? Yep. Okay. All right. So um, the exam is going to be on Blackboard. It opens Monday on the 4th and it, at 8 a.m. and it closes Sunday at 11.59 p.m. So if you have questions, um, just give me a call so that I can help you uh, get where you need to go. Just like today, if I had somebody to call about Zoom, we would not have had trouble. <laughs> okay, so what if you missed the exam? If you missed the exam, but you didn't arrange an extension with me, you're gonna have to provide some sort of documentation of a university recognized excuse. Um, and it will have to account for the majority of the week. If you contact me ahead of time, um, we can agree on an extension, but if you miss the exam, then we'll have to uh, have some documentation. So the format of the exam uh, has two parts. So be sure you do both parts. You've got part one and part two. It'll say exam 1A, exam 1B. Um, it's in the two parts are labeled that way so that part one is your multiple choice. You get 60 minutes to do the multiple choice. It's 30 questions, you get two points per question. So we time that independently of the short answer questions because I don't want you to spend too much time on the short answer questions and not have enough time for the multiple choice. Um, it also gives you the opportunity to break it up in terms of the testing process. So if you decide you want to do the multiple choice one day and the short answer portion another day, you can. So you don't have to do it all at once. The short answer portion has uh, eight questions. They're worth five points apiece, and you have 10 minutes per question. So that's a total of 80 minutes. If you happen to have testing accommodations and you need me to extend your time or something of that nature, I just need you to contact me so that I can do that. Uh, I just told you that each exam, each section of the exam is timed independently of itself so that you can take it at two separate times. You can take it all at the same time. You just have to launch it twice. So what can you use on the exam? You may use your textbook. You may use your lecture notes, but that's it. No outside sources. Um, definitely, I think you, if you, I think that you've looked things up on Google, you will end up getting a zero for that question. So don't do that. Get credit for your work. Um, let's look at the styles we've gone over. There are styles to choose from for the exam, or I'm sorry, these are the styles that are covered on the exam. Well, now, wait a minute. This isn't going to work because this is Art History 1. Hang on. Let me share Art History 2 with you. Art History 1 isn't going to do you any good. Ah. 
sorry, they look a lot alike. Okay. Okay, so let's look at the styles we've gone over. Um, we've gone over Proto-Renaissance, the International Gothic style, early Northern Renaissance, early Renaissance in Italy, the Venetian Renaissance and high Renaissance in Northern Europe. Um, as you know, we can break down each style by listing the stylistic characteristics of the artistic era. Um, that's a really fancy way of saying, what do you think of when you think of high Renaissance? Um, so for example, we know that high Renaissance art in Italy is characterized by two elements. The ideal plus the real gives you high Renaissance. So let's go back and break down the styles that we've studied from the beginning of the unit. So we talked about Proto-Renaissance. If you remember, Proto-Renaissance has lots of gold leafing in the background. We get lots of golden halos around the heads. The figures tend to feel flat and they're staggered on top of each other. Um, and they feature a wonky set of perspective. And I'll point that out to you in a minute. The two artists that we studied primarily um, in the Proto-Renaissance were Cimabue and Giotto. Um, remember that in the Proto-Renaissance, there's some uh, artistic styling based on location within Italy. That's not something you're gonna need to know. You won't have to point that out. Um, just identifying that it's Proto-Renaissance is plenty. Um, remember that Giotto begins to define space in this era through atmospheric perspective. Uh, we get to see the very first secular work of art since antiquity, which is the um, effects of good government in the Palazzo Publico in Siena. Um, and we get the first recognizable landscape. That's that work we just talked about from Siena. And um, they start using the predella. Historical things to remember, humanism is really coming into the picture um, and they're starting to rely on the classical themes from antiquity. So here the stylistic features are listed for you again. We see lots of gold halos. You see that behind Mary's head, behind the angel's heads, um, and you see the gold leafing on the um, icon behind her. Now use that word icon loosely. Um, most icons are not this big. This was a icon screen painting, so it would have gone at the front of the church. It was for public use. Um, most icons today are handheld and small. Um, wonky perspective. You can see that if you really look at Mary's throne, the people that sit underneath Mary's throne um, are the donors. Those are the donor portraits. And you get the idea that the throne recedes into space and that the donors are in the foreground of the picture plane. As the throne recedes into space, Mary sits in the throne. Now hierarchy of scale is definitely at play here. Mary's bigger than everybody else. Um, and you can see that as she sits on the throne, the throne recedes into space but you can't exactly figure out how Mary's body is placed on that throne in logical um, visual logic, right? Like she sits on the throne, she's got one foot on the step and one foot down on the second step. But where her knee is in there, you assume it's under Jesus. But if you start to map it out, that's not the way that works. And it's hard to figure out where her body recedes into space and what's um, comes forward at you. Um, you can see that the angels add to that sense of flatness and that wonky perspective because they stagger on top of each other to communicate res um, recession of space. So the angels that are um, in the front of the picture plane are the ones that are closest to you. They overlap backwards until they get to the very back angel. So you get this sense of flatness that comes out of this. Um, this is just a trait of proto-Renaissance work, that sense of flatness. Everything feels like it's stamped on top of each other. Um, you could almost say that it looks like a coloring book page. So 
So international Gothic style is the next era of art history that we discussed. Um, we discussed it along with Proto-Renaissance in the first unit. Um, it features elongated fi figures and a lavish use of gold. The thing that really sets Proto-Renaissance apart from international Gothic style is that the international Gothic style tends to feature this really lacy looking decorative framing of the painting. So I'll show you that here in a minute. Um, there's an abundant use of decoration and pattern. Uh, in terms of examples, the Vester, Ves, bleh, sorry, the Vester, Vesper build Pieta is there. Um, and we talk about Simone Martini's enunciation that we're getting ready to use, look at. I don't know whether we made a big deal out of the Vesper build Pieta in the very um, first lesson. Uh, I know it's listed there as an example, but I would know Simone Martini's enunciation. Uh, so here is Simone Martini's enunciation. Uh, you can see that intricate frame that I talked about in the beginning. Um, it's very lacy looking. It's carved into the framing of the painting. Um, and then it's gold leafed. Who loves this type of styling is the, the um, ruling elite. So the ruling elite love this styling. Why? It's less humanistic. It's less threatening to them. Um, <clears throat> you have not as much hierarchy of scale as we see in the Proto-Renaissance works. You have more elongated looking figures. They're less human looking. They don't have as many individualizing features and their proportions are still a little bit odd. Uh, you see Mary here, she's frightened. She turns away from the angel. She pulls her robe up over towards her face. Um, she is dressed in finery. So she looks like she is um, the queen of heaven and she's sitting in that wonky perspective. Um, you could even say that Mary has the S curve to her figure. Um, the angel Gabriel is presenting flowers to her. Um, these flowers are symbols of Mary's virginity. Uh, so you get a little bit of symbolism in the international Gothic style, but not a whole lot. You can see that the atmospheric perspective is also not as strong as it is in the Proto-Renaissance works. Um, the room recedes into space. Uh, you can see that through the ledge that Mary's throne and Mary sits on is placed, um, but it really truly does not have as many humanizing features as the Proto-Renaissance. We talked about early Northern Renaissance. So early Northern Renaissance features S-curved figures, attention to texture and miniature detail, iconography and atmospheric perspective. Who did we look at in the early Northern Renaissance? It was so prolific. It was mostly uh, Van Eyck. Van Eyck's Giovanni Arnolfini's wedding portrait and the Ghent altarpiece, along with the man in red turban. Remember at this time, the printing press is invented. Um, the first time we get movable type combined with the press. And so we also looked at the Nuremberg Chronicle was something that was printed with a printing press. Um, things that set early Northern Renaissance apart is that three quarter profile view and the use of oil paint. Um, the middle class here becomes patrons. They become the donors of the works of art. So let's look at some art from early Northern Renaissance. You get this bright use of vivid color that comes through from the oil paints. Uh, you can see that the atmospheric perspective is much more sophisticated than what we saw in the Proto-Renaissance. You've got entire figures that stand in front or behind each other, but those figures have volume. They take up space. And so you can see how the um, modeling, the highlights and the shadows are featured within the painting to create a sense of depth 
and space. Um, if you look closely, Van der Weyden does an excellent job of communicating emotion through dynamic angles and through um, details within the expression of the figures. Um, for example, the woman that's standing on the left side of the painting um, is crying, her hand is in her head and she's got a um, towel over her tears. The way that van der Weyden really creates drama has to do with the S-curve of Mary's body and Mary's body mimicking the shape of Jesus being taken off of the cross. Um, you get these dynamic gestures that come um, through the other people, people holding Mary, people holding Jesus. Um, and then the other part of this that makes this really a prominent early Northern Renaissance work has to do with the textures. If you look closely at the textures of the fabric, you can see that the um, man who stands holding Jesus's legs has on a fine detailed robe. It's made of fur, um, which means he was a more prominent person in society. The priest stands behind him. Um, you can see that he's the priest because he wears all black. Uh, and then you have the Roman official that's taking Jesus off of the cross. He's holding Jesus's shoulders. How do I know this? It all has to do with iconography. So you have to look really close to figure out who the characters in the story are, but their um, attire gives you clues to who the people in the story are. Um, Mary is typically dressed in a royal color. So royal blue is sort of the color they like to put her in. Um, John stands behind her, Jesus's brother, who's catching Mary, and Elizabeth, who's supporting Mary, too. So let's look at some more early Northern Renaissance, um, and maybe we'll get a better idea about how they use that iconography to communicate. So this is Van Eyck's The Man in Red Turban. Um, if you remember, I said that early Northern Renaissance focuses on the three-quarter profile view. Um, the three-quarter profile view is the face being turned at an angle to three quarters of the picture plane. So you don't see the side profile and you don't see the entire face front on. You see one whole side and then a quarter of the other side of the face. We get lots of attention to texture. Um, I think it's a little bit harder to see in this one compared to um, the wedding portrait because uh, Van Eyck wears a robe that is made of fur, um, but it's dark in color. And the background that he sits against is also dark in color. He does an excellent job though of communicating the texture of the skin. Uh, you can easily see um, that the person is not uh, 20 years old. They're in their middle stage of life. And you can see that he doesn't try to create perfectionism in the face. You get an idea of exactly what this person looks like. Um, it's a self-portrait, so this is Van Eyck himself. Let's see, the bright red color in his turban is um, part of the effects that we get from the oil paint. But you can also see that um, Oil paint takes longer time to dry. So you get these nice subtle nuances in terms of um, highlights and dark uh, in the portrait. So like here, you get this nice dark shadow. And then over here, you get this nice light highlight. That's all about oil paint. Um, in other mediums, you can't get that type of variety to come through without actually placing a different color on the canvas. Because oil paint takes so long to dry, you can add glazing to it, which allows you to see the other colors that you've placed on the canvas underneath the color that you put on top. Um, so because of that, you get this nice, um, detailed, very realistic looking representation. Van Eyck knows this and he prefers to use oil paint over anything else. Um, and so because of that, uh, oil paints are popularized by Van Eyck. They haven't reached Italy yet, 
Um, so when we talk about early Renaissance in general, uh, if you see a painting done in oil paints, it is early Northern Ren. If you see a painting that is done um, in an Italian style, it doesn't belong to uh, early Italian Renaissance. It belongs to a later time in the Renaissance history because they didn't have oil paints until a little bit later. All right. Um, early Northern Renaissance painting, I said, creates this extreme attention to detail. If you blow up this painting, you will see every single hair in the dog. You will see the texture of the fur, so clearly it looks as if you could touch it. Um, and you can see the texture in the shoes and the wooden floor, like it's a photograph. Only it's not, it's a painting. Um, unlike Van der Weyden, Van Eyck is not an emotional um, painter. He appeals to our emotion and wows us with his attention to texture and detail. Um, but it isn't the same type of drama as what we see in Van der Weyden. He creates atmospheric perspective and I challenge my students in the classroom to take a ruler and try to draw all the straight lines in this work of art to one single point and you can't do it. So at this point, one point perspective hasn't been invented yet and they haven't figured out exactly how to make all the points converge into one space. Is it because they're not smart enough? They're not sophisticated enough? Absolutely not. They've been able to communicate sophistication through attention to texture and detail. It just wasn't something that they thought of yet. Um, it's not something they've focused on yet. So uh, you can see that he creates a sense of atmospheric perspective by layering objects within the canvas. So the dog and the shoes are first and foremost in the picture plane. Uh, Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife stand behind the dog and the shoes. So you know that they're close to the picture plane, but not directly up front. The bed recedes into space and we get a sense of where the middle ground is because of that chandelier. Without the chandelier, this room doesn't work. Um, if you take a piece of paper and cover up that chandelier, you realize that this room is really flat looking. Um, as you recede uh, back into space, the very smallest thing in the room, according to the painting, is that little mirror and the necklace that hangs next to the little mirror, as well as the signature of Van Eyck that hangs above the mirror. All of those things are done in complete miniature detail. And if you blow up the mirror, the entire room is actually reflected in that mirror. This is the um, sort of uh, impressiveness of early Northern Renaissance painting. It's highly textured, it's highly detailed. The focus on the fabrics are um, inherent because the texture or the detail is so important to them. So they're gonna use fabrics that are more textured. So like velvet, like fur. Um, another thing that I told you was really important is iconography. So Giovanni and Ar Arnolfini and his wife are fur traders. You can tell that because Arnolfini wears a fur cloak over top of his clothing. He wears this uh, hat that's very dramatic. Um, the hat communicates that he's a businessman. He makes a lot of money. Um, Mrs. Arnolfini uh, is wearing a very ornate dress um, with stitching at the bottom that is that uh resembles puckering and they both are dressed in the upper middle class wealthy um style so how would you know that without doing some research and finding out what people from early northern renaissance wore um i think that you can tell just by looking at them that they are some prominence or importance in the community because they wear such expensive fine fabrics um, in terms of clothing. 
You also get a clue as to when they were from because the clothing has such a unique style to it. If you look at her forehead really closely, let me move my window over here. You can see that um, at this time they pluck the hair away from their forehead because a high forehead was considered to be beautiful. And they pull their hair back and pin it towards their head so you can see how tall their forehead is. Um, these things are things that say they have time um, in their daily lives to focus on their appearance and to um, wear these finer fabrics. So you would at least know that they're upper middle class, um, even if you couldn't place exactly where they were from, you would be able to see, well, they're upper middle class folks, possibly business people. All right, I'm gonna stop here and ask if you have any questions. Any questions before we move on to the next style? Okay. So this is early Renaissance in Italy. Early Renaissance in Italy looks very different than Renaissance painting, early Renaissance painting in Northern Europe. Um, it focuses on the classical and classical themes left over from antiquity. And we see a sense of idealism and realism. Artists that we studied that um, we associate with the early Renaissance in Italy were Donatello, Ghiberti, and Brunelleschi. One point perspective is developed by Brunelleschi. And Popular right now in Italy is side profile portrait painting. So if we compare that to Northern Europe, early Northern Wren focuses on the three quarter profile view. So if you happen to get an image that's a three quarter profile view, you know that it's early Northern Renaissance. Um, if you happen to get a side profile view, it is likely early Renaissance in Italy. We get the first life-size equestrian figure since antiquity during this time and the first life-size nude since antiquity. We also see a revival of contrapposto. Um, common elements within the painting, fresco paintings often focus on the memento mori, that moral um, symbol that says at one point, everyone will die. We see that guilds become prominent in um, artwork and they focus on the Holy Trinity, the representation of Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. Um, the Della Pitura is written and churches become more modulated. So early Renaissance in Italy begins the ideal and push for realism we get a resurgence of classical themes. And this example from Polo Iowolo is perfect because it is a classical theme. This is Hercules and Antaeus' wrestling from mythology. It is a small bronze. Bronze sculpture um, is popularized here in Italy. Um, and so, also, they're focusing on the opportunity to create such realistic sculpture that they do it in all angles of the sculpture. And so we get this nice, beautiful sculpture in the round. Sculpture in the round simply means that you can view the sculpture from any point around the sculpture and it doesn't have a right or wrong place to view it from. You can see that Hercules is picking up Antaeus. They're having an argument, um, assuming it's a physical altercation of some type. And you can see all the muscles in the body flexed and reflected here. That push for realism comes from the detailed way in which they represent the body. Early Northern Renaissance, they tend to put more detail in the fabrics the textures of the things around them, not so much the humans. And so when you look at early Renaissance um, in Italy, it feels more humanistic than Northern Renaissance. One point perspective is invented 
This is Gaberti's Jacob and Esau. How to get to Gaberti find one point perspective. Brunelleschi invents it and brings it back to um, Florence. If you take a ruler and you connect all of the straight lines within this work of art, all of the vertical lines, that is, they converge at one point over here. This is one point perspective. If you take a ruler and draw the lines from the vertical angles, you'll see that they all connected to one space in the center. If it has one point perspective, it has to be Italian because the Northern cultures don't pick up on one point perspective for some time. Um, I mentioned that the side profile view becomes very important in Italy. Um, here it is. This is the way they like to represent their um, figures. Why? It's likely because it's easy to um, communicate iconography when uh, having a figure inside profile. The um, face and the actual individual face is not focused on as much when you look at the side profile. What's focused on is the decoration that um, the sitter wears. Uh, you can see that the woman on the left has a uh, very ornate hairdo. It comes from them being able to weave the ribbon into her hair and into the um, hair accessory that's at the back of her head. Um, if you look at the top of her head, she even has hair woven into these little pearls at the top of her head. Um, she wears jewelry. That is uh, something that is expensive. And you can see that they wear clothing that is made of finer fabrics. Um, obviously, the man doesn't wear quite as many ornate details, but he has this fancy hat and um, the fabric of his clothing is very ornate. All right, that's the end of early Italian Renaissance. Any questions on early Italian Renaissance? Okay, uh, I had a question. Yep, go ahead. Um, with Donatello's, uh, the, the his uh the, the niche uh statue mm -hmm. that he won uh would that be also be uh in the round or is that more just a focus on contrapasta it's not in the round the reason it's not in the round is because it was meant to um sit in that niche so he knows that the back of it is not going to be seen um so it's meant to be viewed from the front um you bring up a good point. Early Italian Renaissance art features contrapposto. So if you see someone in contrapposto, it um, your your first reaction is to think it's Italian. Um, placing it within the Italian timeline becomes next. But I guess what I would tell you is that sculpture in the round is one of those things that they tend to sit like in the center of the room, so you can look at it in all angles. Um, Whereas Donatello's work, because it was going in the niche, isn't sculpture in the round. Gotcha. So like David would be an example of in the round. Yes, David is an example of in the round. Yeah, exactly. Um, both Davids actually. The um, yeah, the David that um, Michelangelo sculpts is in the round, and so is Donatello's David. Does that Thank clear you. that up? Yeah. Okay. All right, so moving on to high Renaissance, we end up with this extreme sense of ideal plus real. So we got an, a bit of a foothold in the realism with early Italian Renaissance, but now we're gonna push that realism uh, to be hyper-realistic. And we get this sense of idealism that comes in high Renaissance work. Um, <clears throat> I'll come back to this slide after we go over the attributes. So um, if you're looking at high Renaissance in Italy, you're looking at works of art that are likely from um, Italy and Florence. Remember that Venice is another style 
it's a Venetian Renaissance. It's a little bit different. All right, so um, the form takes up uh, characteristics of the figure being drawn before it's painted. And so these figures tend to have this sculptural feeling. They feel weighty. They look voluminous. <clears throat> Excuse me. We see a lot of corkscrew turn in the torso and they like that pyramidal shape that comes from placing the um, larger person at the base and adding typically baby Jesus into the triangle. I'll show you that here in a minute. Um, artists that we studied are usually your famous uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle artists, uh, the Raphaelites, Donatello, Michelangelo, I'm sorry, Donatello is early, um, Michelangelo, uh, Da Vinci, Raphael, those are all um, high Renaissance artists from Italy. Um, we see a total resurgent in the return to classical themes from antiquity. Um, the Medici family is in power. They are commissioning lots of art. Um, and then Florence is taken over by another group of people and they're banned for a short time. So let's go back to that ideal plus real and look at da Vinci's version of the rocks. The idealization comes in this work of art through the pyramidal, pyramidal seating of the figures and the um, youthful way that he depicts Mary and Elizabeth. <clears throat> These women are depicted as being very idealistic. Whether or not Mary actually looked like that, whether or not Elizabeth actually looked like that, we don't know. It is likely um, that you probably, there's enough individualizing features in this that you wouldn't, that you would say they have idealistic looking people. Um, I don't think that you could go pick somebody out on a sidewalk and say that's a portrait of this person. Um, and so the idealization comes from the pyramidal shape and how youthful and beautiful the faces are. Uh, you see, them all having a sacred conversation. That's how they're relating to one another. Even the babies point and have gestures. Um, in terms of the realism, the way the figure is represented, where you can see the muscles in the baby's arms, you can see them kneeling, that is the um, realism that we get. Additionally, da Vinci is really good at communicating realism through sfumato. Sfumato is the way the light is treated on the face. So if you're looking here, Mary has a face that has this blurred edge around the edges of the face and the eyes and at the chin. That's sfumato. Um, the babies have that same dark uh, smoky effect along the edge of the face and at the edge of the eyes. As the volume recedes into space, you get that um, heavy smoky feeling. Da Vinci observes this in the natural environment and brings it into his paintings to show that he's able to um, mimic the natural way the body turns in the light um, with oil paints. Uh, oil paints have now been brought to Italy and they are popular. Another one that we look at when we talk about um, high Renaissance in Italy is Raphael. In Raphael's work, I think it's a little bit easier to see the diseño style. Um, if you put a point up here above Mary's head and you draw lines all the way down to the base of her figure, you get a nice pyramid shape. That pyramid shape is anchored by her leg. Mary feels weighty. She feels heavier than um, 
the works of art that we compare to with the Colore style. Um, she could be translated into sculpture very easily from this painting. You see that she holds the baby. Um, the baby's proportions to Mary create the perfect pyramid. You can see the corkscrew turn of the spine because she holds his bottom as it recedes back into space. And then the spine has to sort of contort to reach towards the top of her um, neck. So if you start at the shoulder blade, you can draw that corkscrew turn of the spine that we get. Um, the baby definitely has a more realistic looking baby body. It's chubby, it's a uh, little kid-like. Madonna is definitely depicted in idealized fashion. She has a youthful look on her face. Um, her skin is perfect. There's no blemish to it. Um, and you get this nice idealized feel to her face. This idealization creates a sense of serenity in high Italian Renaissance work. Um, we often talk about Michelangelo's Pietà when we talk about that serenity feeling. It comes from the fact that the figures sit so perfectly next to each other in proportion. Um, and because of that, you get this good sense of the proportions giving you this idealized harmony. Okay. So <clears throat> you heard me mention that difference between the Clore and the Diseño. Don't forget that Diseño is built from a drawing and so the figures feel more sculptural. Um, for example, this drawing here by Michelangelo in the sepia tone, um, he could definitely create a sculpture from that drawing. Uh, you can see all of the individual muscles within uh, where Adam sits. You can see how um, the muscle structure has been heavily studied by Michelangelo. The figure, while it's just a drawing, feels weighty. It feels heavy. You can understand that this is a massive person that he's drawing. Whereas the Colore style is not based on a drawing. It doesn't have that same heavy feel. If I look at the drawing from the Desenio style, I can easily envision what it would look like in marble. Whereas in the Colore style, there's not enough um, muscular detail for me to really be able to understand what that figure would look like if we sculpted it. It would, the sculpture would look different than what the drawing looks like. Um, it has a sensual feel to it that focuses on texture. You can see that um, the way it focuses on texture is not necessarily to depict every little ounce of texture within the fabric. It's to um, communicate very realistically what the fabric looks like as it turns in the light. You see the way that um, the Venus lays for the sitter. She's propped up on an elbow and her body tends to have this nice, soft, gentle feel. She's kind of like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Like if you reached out and squeezed, squeezed her tummy, it would be soft and cushy. Whereas the Desenio, there's no soft and cushy about that at all. And if you compare it to the Desenio you see in Raphael's work, you could reach out and squeeze Mary's arm, but in your head, it feels harder, more voluminous. All right, so in the Colore, we mostly see this from the Venetian Renaissance. Uh, you get this nice dreamy feel because of the softness that happens. Colore is created by building paint on the canvas. And so what builds the form here are the shadows, the highlights and the darks. Um, it just has a very different feel than the Desenio. All right, any questions about high Renaissance in Italy? Okay, let's move on to Venetian. So we just looked at an example of Venetian. Let's talk about what makes Venetian Renaissance, Venetian Renaissance. Um, it's the Colore style. You get these painterly shapes. The form is constructed by color. 
it has a more sensual feeling. The bodies are still idealized. If you go back to that painting, um, you'll see that the Venus that's sitting there in the um, painting for the artist has a very idealized body. She's the quintessential reflection of beauty. Um, it has an emotional feel to it. It feels sensual. Uh, the two artists that we focus on when we talk about Venetian Renaissance are Titian and Giorgione. Um, Venice is a city that's located on the water. It tends to have this real relaxed feel to it and it's isolated from the rest of Italy. And so you just get this interesting spin on the um, hallmarks of high Italian Renaissance. This is a famous painting by Giorgione called The Pastoral Concert. Um, and you can see that he focuses on some of those qualities that we see from the mainland in Italy. You get um, that pyramidal shape of the figures. He's grouping them in threes. Um, our eye tends to gravitate towards odd numbers instead of even. Um, and so this grouping of three is an idealized form. You see the women that sit in front of him that are nude. They also have that sensual, soft feeling to the texture of the skin. That sensual, soft feeling is um, communicated through color placement. So the mid-tones of the back, the light of the shoulders, and the dark of the form receding into space. It has a dreamy feel for a couple of reasons. For one thing, everything's construct constructed based on color, not based at color and highlight and dark, not based on the drawing. It doesn't have that weighty feel that the Desenio style has. But what you do get is this sense of dreamlike feel. And that happens also in the subject matter. The two men are conversing with one another, but they're not looking at the women. The women are nude. And so that is somewhat unusual for male behavior. We think that they were their muse. They are there as a figment of the men's imagination, not necessarily there in um, real life. Okay, so any questions about Venetian Renaissance or Colore versus Desenio? Okay. All right, so let's talk about mannerism. Mannerism we studied on the tail end of high Renaissance. Um, and that's because it's a reaction to the high Renaissance. Uh, mannerism has some very strict rules to it um, that tend to follow most mannerist works. So we're gonna look at those in a minute. Um, artists that we studied in the mannerist style were Pontormo, Bologna and Bronzino. Bronzino tends to be a portrait painter. Excuse me. Oh, sorry. Um, Bologna is a sculptor and Pontormo is a um, painter. I tend to show you oil paintings as representations of the styles that are featured. It's just because it's easier um, to see uh, we still study lots of sculpture and things like that in this um, time period. So mannerism follows four really important rules. One is this strange, unrealistic um, contortion of the body. And I'll show you that here in a minute. They have unrealistic colors. They tend to irritate your eyes. We call them acidic. Um, they don't have any real setting. You can't look at the scene and go, oh, that's in a grotto. Um, you can't look at a scene and say, oh, that's in my neighbor's backyard, um, because there really isn't any uh, information as to what the scene is. So we'll look at that in a second as well. Um, the figures often seem to have an overly exaggerated emotional reaction. And the only way to see that is to look closely at the figures themselves. So first of all, I claimed that there were these contortions of the body. You can see them here. You see how this guy stands on his tiptoes? Yeah, he's supporting the weight of a 200 plus pound man. That's just not humanly possible. When you look at the colors, 
you see that the back of this man looks as if he's wearing a light pink t-shirt. He's not, that's his skin. When you compare it to the lady's dress in the foreground, they look about the same color. Um, and then Pantormo strategically places that red and pink next to various um, parts of the painting to highlight um, the movement of the painting, but also to highlight the emotional reaction that the um, figures have. So Mary has this look of despair on her face. She reaches out towards Jesus. Um, the woman behind her though is very moved and looks up at Mary in um, pity, I would say, maybe empathy. Um, if you see, if you really wanna see emotion in terms of the reaction on the faces, this guy right here, has this really haunting look on his face. His eyes are not detailed. They have this hollowness to them. Let's see. And then I said that um, mannerism paintings take place in an area that has no real setting. So the frame to this particular painting makes it feel as if it's taking place in some sort of place, but it doesn't give you enough information within the background to figure out what place it's happening in. You get this cloud over here. Um, there's this bluish sky, but you have no idea where that bluish sky is located in terms of geography. In addition to, you get the idea that there's a floor here because it, the, um, the area that represents the floor has a lot of color variation and a lot of um, dark and light variation. So as it goes back into space, it gets darker back here. So you get the idea that they're standing on a floor, but that's about all you know. <clears throat> we have tried very hard to recreate this painting through um, something called a tableau vivant, where people um, take on the gestures of the people in the painting and they try to recreate the way the people stand in the painting. And what happens is that the guy that's standing in front can't possibly support the weight of a human being. And so in the recreation, the person in the front is always flat or flat footed and holds on to something because you can't support that kind of weight. Um, as you go back though, it's difficult without standing on some sort of stairs or something like that to get a placement for the rest of the figures. So it's kind of like this scene happened somewhere out there and they painted it and then dropped it somewhere on the earth. You really can't tell where it takes place. Any questions about mannerism? Okay. So that is the end of the different styles that we looked at. Let's do a little practice some provenance practice. So this work of art, I am telling you, is early Italian Renaissance. Can you tell me why? Side uh, portrait view. It is a side profile view. Um, what else? Because I gave you that in the slide, but what else do you see that makes this early Italian Renaissance? Uh, the fabric is more defined and more the highlight in the uh, frame. Yeah, the half fabric's really defined. You get the sense of iconography through what she wears. Um, the hair is in that special hairstyle like we saw um, when we looked at um, the side profile portraits, these. So you see the special attention to the hair. Okay, good job. So. What about this one? It's early Renaissance. Do you know why? Uh, because it's using the, con the contrapposto of uh, po pose and it looks like it's a, a niche. Yep, it uses the contrapposto pose. You've got lots of volume in the figure's robes. Um, that's because it was sponsored by a guild. Um, you get this very realistic looking human being transferred into marble. All right. There's a sense of hyper-realism that comes about. What about this work? 
It's high Renaissance. Why is it high Renaissance? And can you tell me where, where it's from in the high Renaissance? Um, well, it looks like there's a, there's a good sense of the modeling on the textures and it looks a bit solid. It looks like it might be a uh, high uh, Italian Renaissance. It is. It also looks a bit smoky right, around the eyes of the uh, child um, and a little bit of the chin of the mother in the background. Good job. So it looks like it might be Leonardo da Vinci. It is. It's a da Vinci. He uses this fumato and it is in that disegno style, which I know is a little bit harder to see with um, da Vinci because he uses that sfumato so heavily, um, but he is a disegno artist. So good job. Uh, what about this one? It's proto-Renaissance. What, what do you think in terms of um, its stylistic features? What makes it proto? Uh, the hierarchies of scale with the Madonna, mm -hmm. um, the halos in the background of the saints. Yep. Um, a little bit of the wonky perspective in terms of the knees. Mm -hmm. And I would have to say that there doesn't seem to be too much um, naturalism in terms of the faces. They look a little bit yeah. not as defined as later works of art. Yeah, they're definitely not as individualized as some of the other works of art. So who do you think painted this? Um, either Ducio or uh, Kamabui. It's a Chimabue. Good job. Um, you can see the resemblance between it and the Chimabue that we looked at, which is Madonna enthroned, this one. So oh. good that you recognize this style. I just, I was a little bit thrown off because I thought uh, Kamabue liked to do a lot of gold leafing. He does. So you can see the gold leafing in the background. Oh, that's okay. Definitely, that's definitely gold leafing. Um, the throne is painted very similar to the other one that we looked at. Um, some people tell me they think this is Giotto because the throne actually sits on the floor like the one that we looked at. Um, by Giotto, Mary enthroned. Um, but it has some of Chimabue's signature, which is this weird knee that just sort of disappears underneath Jesus. If you start to look at her feet, they're exactly like the feet from the other painting. You've got this one leg that's dropped down here and this other knee that's like, where'd it go? So I, I call that Chimabue's disappearing knee. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, I'm just listing for you there why that's a Chimabue. Okay, what about this one? It's early Northern Run. Why? Um, I think there's kind of the S curve a little bit, maybe with Jesus. Mm hmm You got an S curve in there. You got more it than just Jesus in the S curve. Just about all the figures there have that. I think it's really prevalent in Mary here because her hip kicks out here and then her shoulders go back against the um, cross. Um, maybe if I could like zoom in, I'd be able to see the more yes. of the emotions. Yeah, that could that could be another indication that it's Northern European. Absolutely. I would agree. Um. Maybe iconography, maybe there's a lot of detail in, in the textures where you can kind of tell how each person's lives in terms of the roles that they fit. Like, for instance, the female on the far on the far left looks like she might be a nun or some mm -hmm. kind of a high religious figure. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, the other iconography that you could point to is this woman with this uh, hairstyle. This fabric that they wear over their head is northern. It's a trait of Northern Renaissance work. So um, I think the other thing that you can see that's very different than the Italian Renaissance work has to do with the way they model the figure. You see here, you get some sense of volume in Mary's figure. There's a little bit of a sense of volume. You get the idea that the sleeve turns in space, but exactly how it does it is a little bit confusing. But if you go back to say 
let's compare early. So we're not, so we're comparing apples to apples. Um, Well, I don't have a, the I don't have an early Renaissance example in this, but you can see how the attention to detail in the fabrics gives you a really realistic idea of how this fabric recedes into space, right? So you know how the sleeve fabric lays on Elizabeth's arm. When you look at the early Northern Renaissance painting that I gave you, the fabric makes sense, but you don't have as clear of a depiction of how the volume moves in space. Do you see that? Yeah, it looks like it's kind of a little bit of folds. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like some folds in areas, but it's not really that um, distinct. Yeah, it's not as descriptive. Like you get an idea of how the form turns in space here. You get an idea of how the veil comes over to the front of the body. Like you can, you logically know what that looks like in real life. But here, there's no confusion as to what the fabrics do in real life. They're so very um, distinct in terms of the highlighting and modeling and things like that. Okay, um, this one's early Italian. I don't know why I put that back in there because we just looked at it um, in here. <laughs> you already told me why it was early Italian. Um, this one is Venetian. How do you know? This one's uh a little bit harder. I would just have to say like the colors look so vivid and like it looks soft. Yeah, it's softer looking. It's softer looking than the Desenio. This one probably wouldn't be one I would put on the test because it's not quite as clear cut Venetian. If I'm gonna ask you what, um, if it's Colore or, Vene or Desenio, it, it will be obvious. It's not gonna be something that you have to guess at. All right, and last but not least, this work of art is international Gothic style. Um, we only looked at one example of the international Gothic style. So let's uh, noodle this out together. What do you think is your first clue that this is international Gothic? Uh, the gold, the, the amounts of gold uh, that surrounds uh, the, the entire frame. Yeah, it's the it's the imbalance of the gold that surrounds the entire frame. It's just lots and lots of gold. Then you get this interesting ornate detail here. That's actually built into the frame. I know it's a little bit harder to see, but it is. It's built into the frame. So then um, you have this scene, which is a little bit more chaotic than the scene that we looked at in the international gold or the international gothic style that um, was in the review at the very beginning, because uh, you got a more complex uh, grouping of figures. But what you do have is the gold halos and the interactions between the people worshiping Mary. Um, and the figures are not as realistic looking. This is another one of them that's kind of like on the borderline that I would not ask, I would not test you over. I just am trying to have you practice your skills with recognizing the international Gothic style. Um, I would say that the dead giveaway for the international Gothic style has to do with the way the frame is built up. These are separate pieces of wood that are glued onto the painting and then gold leafed. So if you've got this like frame that feels like it's projecting as very ornate and frilly, uh, your brain should say that's international Gothic style. Okay, so I know, Brandon, you had some questions for the review sheet. Do you want to go ahead and ask those for me? Sure. Um, so uh, I'm, I, as I'm looking at the review sheet, I think the first thing that I'm kind of looking at um, that's, that's on uh, my list is looking at relief sculptures. I think okay. it was in if I remember correctly, that was in proto-Renaissance um, works with the with those um, 
were they I know they were religious, right? For for the give speeches on top of they had um I know I know how I know it looks like in my mind, but I can't really describe it. Okay. Let me pull up the um review sheet. It will help me see what you're talking about here. That's our history one. Page two. Oh, just the term relief sculpture in general. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want you to know to be able to use the term. So um, a relief sculpture that we looked at would have been like this. So this is a relief sculpture. It has um, objects that project from the flatness of the panel. Um, and it's a sculpture. Uh, typically when you talk about sculpture, you're either talking about a relief sculpture or freestanding sculpture. Um, relief sculpture is simply sculpture that's done on a panel. So it's connected to a background. Whereas this, this is a um, freestanding sculpture. So um, that's a good example of the difference. I just wanted you to be able to know what, be able to use the term relief sculpture. Um, Let's see if I can get, oh, another example would be the panels um, for the contest that Gaberti and Brudaleski sculpted. Those are um, relief panels. So that's uh, all you really have to know. Okay, uh, what about composite view? Is it similar to atmospheric perspective? That it's the, no. <clears throat> okay, composite view. And I don't know if I have one in here. Composite view is the combination of two different types of perspective. So where I can think of that we looked at that prominently was the effects of the government in the Plaza Publico in Siena. So if you think about the effects of good government, here, let me see if I, I'll just pull it up. Okay. So if you look at, oh, it's not a great image. So if you look at the effects of good government, oh, there we go. Here is, do you see how this is a side profile view? Like the people are going down the city in the side. Mm -hmm. But if you pan out a little bit, the landscape is viewed from like a vantage point above the city. And they kind of squish it all together so they can put as much information in the painting as possible. That's composite view. It's this idea that you've got two different perspectives um, in the piece. Another one that we looked at like that was the Marode altar piece. That here in the Marod altarpiece, the twisted perspective or the composite view has to do with this table right here. Everything else that you're looking at is head on, but the table is turned up towards the picture plane so you can see the objects on the table. Here as gotcha. well with Joseph's bench. So would I expect you to be able to be um, real diligent in picking that out no because you've only seen two or three examples of it i just put it on there so you like when you if you're writing an essay or something you'd be able to talk about it in proper terms mm -hmm. yeah um i guess uh for another uh term on the review sheet of uh, the lost wax process okay the lost wax process is important Donatello is the one that brings it back into Italy. And the reason it's important is because it tends to be a measure of sophistication of a society. It was something that was developed in antiquity by ancient cultures long ago. 
And the fact that it's resurfaced in um, Renaissance art, it comes back because Donatello uses it to create sculpture. Mm. Let's see, let me pull up review. Sorry, I'm moving my windows around and lost my, I have too much stuff on the desktop. That's all there is to it. Um, okay. Here, this little sculpture is done using the last wax process. Any bronze sculpture you see um, from this time period is done using the last wax process. If you wanna see what the last wax process is, you can actually look it up on YouTube and you'll see a really sophisticated video of how they create these sculptures using the last wax process. Um, this one is uh, small. Donatello's David was done using the last black wax process. Verrocchio's David was done using the last wax process. So anything that you see as a life-size bronze sculpture is done using the last wax process. Donatello even creates a full horse using this process. And that is, um, it's impressive because of how large it is. Uh, Well, so Donatello's David was created using the last wax process, but Donatello also creates a full condutier using the last wax process. So you get this um, large bronze sculpture um, and it's the largest one done um, in antique or in the Renaissance time. So bringing back this process allows for a sophistication in sculpture that we haven't seen in a while. It's why it's revolutionary. Gotcha. All right. Um, uh, in terms of, I think the other one that I had on the term sheet was Ashlar Masonry. Yeah, Ashlar Masonry. I only discussed one example. It's the idea that the brick gets more refined as it goes upwards. Uh, what did we talk about? Let's see if I can. I think it was Borromini, maybe. Also, if I spell it right. Guy. Okay, well, and it's the Medici's. There we go. It's the Palazzo in Florence um, that the Medici's commission. So if you look at the term Ashler Masonry, you see how down here the bricks are large and unrefined. Mm -hmm. And as it goes up towards the top, the masonry gets nice and smooth. So here's the idea. They think that just like in the Gothic times, whenever the churches were really, really, really tall, they thought that the more they, the taller they made the building, the closer they were to heaven. Well, in 
the humanistic eras, they represent the architecture so that we as men are unrefined when we're closest to the earth here. And as we get older and go towards the heavens, we get more refined. It's that idea. It's this like parallel between our rough nature as humans to our refined nature as we age and get older and go towards the heavens. I see. Yeah. It's like the building blocks of humankind. But we really only looked at one example. So um, you might get one question on the test about it. You don't have to know like a whole ton about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I guess uh, another one is, and I, and I, and I think I've seen this before with illusion, the illusionist fresco. I think uh, that was, oh. we saw that a little bit in early Italian Renaissance, I think. Right, early Italian. Um, illusionistic fresco is going to rear its head again when we get to the Baroque, but let me untagnose who we look at for that. So when we looked at the camera picta, you remember how I told you that one of these little babies actually pees on you? Yeah, it was, it's a little bit hard to see, but I think it's one of them, right? Yeah, you just have to trust me that it's there. Like you wouldn't be able to see it unless you were actually there. But this is illusionistic fresco. Like these babies really look like they stand over top of you. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them actually pees on the viewer, which is quite hilarious. But it's that detail that says this is illusionistic fresco. Um, it's fresco that's very realistic looking. It feels like it's actually there. This uh, device here where the basket sits on the stick actually feels like it's falling in on top of your head. Um, that's what makes it illusionistic. It creates the illusion that it's actually there. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. You can definitely see that. Um, yeah. What about a uh, continuous narrative? Oh, I'm surprised that's on there. Why did I put that on there? You can scratch it off. Gotcha. Um, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's right next. It's in between Guild and Logia, the con Contorte. The Condutier. I yeah. just showed you a Condutier. The Condutier is that guy that was riding the horse in Donatello's sculpture. It's just a fancy Italian word for police officer. This guy's the condutier. Ah. So what does that, why is that important? Um, it talks about the power of the local government in society. So in Renaissance culture, um, the local government had quite a bit of power. You had these families that were contributing to the economy so greatly. So like the Medici's and the, um, the Strazi family. They all commissioned works of art, but they all had a very large stake in the economic development of the area. The condutier is their link to government. So um, the police officer uh, is representative of how the um, political system sort of ran the areas that we're looking at. So like the Medici's were run out of town because they were too powerful and the incoming group of people uh, felt like they were too powerful. And so because of that, they, um, they, the new people that took over felt like they were too powerful. So they ran them out. Mm -hmm. So it's just, um, it's on there so that you know you remember that the local government helps to control the um, culture and art within the city. It's local too. So like Florence is different than Siena. Like the families that control Florence are different than Siena. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, totally, I follow you there. Okay. Uh, does, what about uh, the term to the right with Logia? Oh, the loggia. The loggia is um, a covered walkway. 
That's all it is. Um, the palazzos have them a lot. Here. So in Italy, if you're in Florence, let's see if I can get a better picture. Well, not so. Okay, see this area right here that's like white, it's underneath the building here. See that? That's a little, yeah. yeah. It's just a covered walkway. It's a fancy name for covered walkway. Um, let me see, the Florentine one's a little bit more pronounced. In fact, if you go to Florence, there's sculpture in their Palazzo Publico. Uh, there's sculpture in their Loggia, I mean. What was seen? There's Florence, oh. Well, I'm having a hard time finding a picture of it. Let's here. This is a loggia. It's just an architectural feature that covers a walkway so that um, they can house sculpture or honestly, what what happens in um, these areas is like something major will be going on in the town. It still happens today. Um, they'll have some speaker, they'll have uh, some sort of entertainment go on in the public Palazzo Publico. And so most cities have a Publico. Um, it's just a public building that you can go into. It's a civic building. Um, this is the one uh, in Florence. It's the Signoria. Um, at any rate, you go into the um, town square and then off to the side is this loggia where you can stand underneath it and sort of take shelter from the sun and the rain. Uh, in Florence now they have sculpture in it too. So it's, it's just part of their um, public building system. It helps keep uh, the people dry. They take that into new heights when we get into the Baroque because St. Peter's takes that Publico idea and extends it with this walkway uh, that's very grand. So what you see in Florence is just the baby step towards this. Gotcha. Um, I guess uh, in terms of the uh, foreshortening, I feel like mm -hmm. it's somewhat similar to the illusionistic fresco, but I, I think it has definitely its own differences, right? It does. So foreshortening is an artistic term that we use to refer to recession in space. So atmospheric perspective is more about like the landscape and the placement of objects. Foreshortening is about the body. So I forget the title here. See this work of art here? This is extreme foreshortening. And actually it's a little wonky. It's a little off. The feet are a lot smaller than it, they should be. They should be like, like if you really looked at a guy from this angle, his feet would be like in your face. But this is foreshortening. It's that recession into space. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. I'm trying to think of what else we looked at that had lots of foreshortening in it. Um, some of the sculpture that we looked at in the very beginning, that was a uh, proto-Renaissance, that was, uh, In the uh, Pisa Baptist. 
So we see sometimes a foreshortening in sculpture when we're looking at a relief sculpture. Oh, come on. Um, see how the arm sort of recedes, the arms recede into space. This is all foreshortening. When you get the head that comes out towards you, anything that comes out directly towards the viewer is done in foreshortening. Um, this isn't as sophisticated. Remember, we're in the Proto-Renaissance. Uh, they're still reviving those tools. But yeah, this is foreshortening too. It's not quite as dramatic. It's not as easy to see as Mantagna's fresco. But that's what foreshortening is. It's one of those terms that's on there so that if you're talking about something, you can use the right term. If it's not something that really jumps out at you, I wouldn't worry about it because I don't ask you anything about it on the test. It's more like when you're talking about a work of art, you, you want to be able to recognize the foreshortening. Is that kind of like the same thing with the X composition as well? No, the X composition is pioneered by Titian. And it creates um, dramatic angles that we, okay. This is Titian's Pesaro Madonna. See how it has this like line that goes straight through the painting. If you connect all the figures here, see that? Yeah. Okay, well, if you go the other way with the flag, see how the flag connects to the rest of the figures down here? Mm -hmm. That's the X composition. And it's used by the Venetians most prevalently to create dramatic um, effects within the painting. So they feel more emotional. The other one we looked at is Tintoretto. It's way more dramatic with the X composition. So you get this table that recedes into space here this way and then the figures connect this way. But when you can pick up this major line of direction that goes back into space, as long as it's not Giotto, it's X composition. We saw that in the lamentation. Oh, oh no. Oh, somehow I got, all right. Brandon, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go. Uh, I am due at the bank here in a minute. Um, do you still have questions about the review sheet? For yeah, I, I could wait until later and we can fill out some of the rest. Most of them are just figures like people you should know of. Okay, I can call you after I get done with the bank. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, I'll call you in just a little bit. All right. Thanks, uh, Jen. You're welcome. Have a good day. You too.